This is not my fault. 
me. You're working through me. You're fighting for me, God. Oh, 
And this Wednesday, praise the Lord, um, Carl, Chuck, and Stanley, and Stan, the man, will be officially installed as assistant pastors this Wednesday at 7 p.m. Uh, yeah. All right. Lifeline screenings. Um, it is Tuesday, August 6th. Um, they'll be here. Um, screenings for risk of heart disease, strokes, and more. Register. You need to register to be screened. Registration information is in bulletin. Happy birthday to Chuck, Carl, which he's not here today. Um, and where's my, where's my usher at? Come on up, fellas.
I can't remember. Seven, seven, oh, uh, Ken. Ken Luck was like, what? Help, what? <laughs> you know, he never comments, but he, that made him comment, you know? <laughs> Let's get over to John chapter 10, guys. John chapter 10. title of this thought process that I'm going to try to take us on, hopefully it will be clear, God help me make it clear, is Jesus is no victim. Jesus is no victim. John chapter 10, I'm going to start at verse 10. I'll be reading out of the ESV today, randomly, because I am not committed to any translation, and if you are, get free. <laughs> Uh, King James is what was good enough for Paul. Uh, no, he had Greek. Okay, King James was a very sinful king who made an English translation in the 1600s. Get saved. All right. Delete that from the podcast. Too. John chapter 10, starting at verse 10. Listen to God's word. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life. And have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays his life down for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who doesn't own the sheep, he sees the wolf coming and he leaves the sheep and he flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he's a hired hand and he cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own. And my own know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also so that they will listen to my voice, and there will be one flock, one shepherd. Verse 17 of John chapter 10. For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. This is the verse of the day, God. Verse 18. No one takes it from me. But I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay my life down, and I have authority to take my life up again. This charge I received from my Father. Again, no one takes it from me. But I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay my life down, and I have authority to take my life up. This charge I received from my Father, the Word of God, for the people of God. In every victim narrative, there's a victim who is wronged, there's a villain who does the wrongdoing, and there's a rescuer who saves the victim. And most of us tell victim stories about our life. Who wronged us? Who hurt us? who didn't love us right, and who we expected to save us, and maybe they did, or maybe they protected us, or maybe they didn't. And every victim narrative, the story we're telling is that somehow we are powerless. And when someone takes away our power and mistreats and hurts us, and life wrongs us, and you guys know this by now, right? Life will wrong you. Then that victim narrative teaches us things. It's how we interpret our story, and then we need somebody to save us all the time. It's somebody's fault. Victim narratives lead to a feeling of powerlessness, and that powerlessness causes us then to be dominated by fears, resentments, and blame. Pain always looks for someone to blame. Anger is usually rooted in pain. Pain always looks for someone to blame. Most of the time when we find resentments and a feeling of stuckness and a whole lot of anxiety ruling us, it's because the story we believe that's true about our life, the story we're telling ourselves about our life, is a victim narrative. And you go, but Tim, I am a victim. You may very well be. Tim, I have been wrong. I guarantee you have. But Tim, it's, you don't understand. I bet I do. And if I'm living in a victim story, I will never be more than the byproduct of how others treat me. 
Say it again, Tim. If I'm living in a victim story, I will never be anything other than the byproduct mm -hmm. of how others treat me. If I'm living in a victim story, I'm only doing as well as life is going. And I'm not beating you up. I'm <coughs> preaching to me, too. And compare that to Jesus. No one takes my life from me. What are you talking about? They came and arrested you. No one takes my life from me. What do you mean? They stripped you. They flogged you. They mocked you. They, they beat you. They, what are you talking about? No one takes your life from you. No one takes my life from me. I lay it down of my own accord. And I have authority. That, that doesn't look like authority. Does this look like authority? It's an electric chair. It's a noose hanging in a gallows. What do you mean? Authority. I have authority to lay it down and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I received from my father. What father? Where was your father then? What are you talking about? And look where they found Jesus at his arrest. Exactly where they knew he would be. And he knew that's where they knew he would be. He had every chance to flee and he put himself right where they would get him. He stuck there. And what was he praying? To not leave. What was he praying? To not flee. What was he praying? Not, Lord, save me. Lord, help me do this thing. I don't want to do this thing, but help me do this thing. I don't want to do this thing, but help me do this thing. With my whole heart, let me do this thing. Let me put these parts of me that are wanting to be in self, self, self protection, self preservation. Let me, let me not submit to those very natural survival instincts that are oriented all towards me. Pain avoids, no. What's he praying for? The grace to die well. The grace why? Why to die? The grace to love well. The grace to fulfill the very reason he was born. He was born to die. Friend, you will too. Just do that. If Jesus had taken the short-term easy path, we usually call it selfishness, but selfishness is it's just short-term impulsive uh, desire for pleasure, really. Jesus has a lot of self-interest. He doesn't take the cross just because he's selfless. He takes the cross because what he wants most is you. He takes the cross because the pain of not having Danielle in his life would be worse than the cross. His sacrifice for you makes him richer. That's crazy, right? So, so he's not selfless. He's just not selfish. It's in his own best interests to see a wiser, bigger picture of the meaning of life and his own choices and actions in the midst of it. And all his sacrifices increase his joy, increase his long-term joy. So let's redefine what selfishness is. But if Jesus had taken the short-term, easy path, it would have led to Jesus living with regret, long-term regret. Had he fled that garden, he would have regretted it. Had he fled that pain, he would have regretted it. Had he preserved his life at the expense of being loved for our sake, he would have regretted it. And the pain would have been worse than the cross. We don't know it because we're not sure what the cross means just yet. But we're beginning to wake up. This is what I picture Jesus thinking in that garden while he's praying. What do I most want? What do I most want? Those are questions many of us don't ask. We impulsively go after what we feel we want to the destruction of ourselves and the people around us. But we don't dig down deep, find out what we really want, and then go after it with wisdom under God. Are you hearing me? Yeah. What do I most want? I want the beloved back, redeemed. And to do that will cost me everything. But the end result has the possibility of being glorious. Okay then, let's go get him. No matter what. If we're honest, and it's good to be honest, isn't it? You and I are only partially awake to our belovedness. 
Are you, are you, do you honestly think you're fully awake to the love of God? What we call revival is usually ankle deep. Right? What we call the best moment we had in our life, maybe, maybe. We're only partially awake to the beauty of God. Partially, at best, at best. But Jesus, not like us, he knows exactly who he is. He knows exactly, he says, I'm the delight of the Father. He knew exactly why he's here. I've been sent as the expression of the Father's heart. And never for a moment, because he was living from that story, because he was living from that story, never for a moment did he let our rejection of him tell him who he is. Never once did he let what we didn't do ruin his life. The story he's telling about his life is not a story of how dare they. How, how dare they? Actually, he knows we're going to betray him. <coughs> he looks me square in the face and says, you're going to fail me. But once you're done, restore your brothers also. Reminder Peter, right? He knew what I would do, not before I met him, after I said my yeses to him. He knew. He's not in this going, if you treat me good, I'll treat you good. He knows I won't because he knows what I'm made of. But it never fools him about my value. And my misbehavior never once fools him about his value or changes his purpose. He never lets sin against him create sin in him. You and I, on the other hand, how many times have we done that last week? Jesus, Hebrews 12, 2. This has been my verse lately. I've just been chewing on this verse for days. Jesus, for the joy set before him, endured the cross, scorning its shame. Dude, he knows all about its shame. He knows all about its pain. But he endured it for the joy set before him. And you all know who the joy was. It was you. Remember in the movie Hook when Peter Pan lost his way and he didn't know how to fly anymore and he's an old beat-up lawyer who's gotten cynical and lost his inner child? And Jesus says, by the way, into the kingdom we have to become like little children again. And children, what do they do all day long? They just want to play. You know when you're fully alive, it feels like playing. When we see a musician doing something amazing, we go, they're playing good today. When we go see a dramatic production, we don't call it a work, we call it a play. Heaven is going to be endless play where the game gets more and more fun. <coughs> and life on earth, as God intended, feels like play. But Jesus, for the what? For the joy set before him. The meaning of the cross, you guys, will be determined by what attitude you think is in Jesus' heart as he takes that cross. The meaning of the cross for you will be entirely determined by what attitude you believe he had in his heart while he takes it. Here's what I mean. If, if you, like me, are, are becoming convinced that Jesus considers losing me worse than the cross, life without Tim would be far worse than the pain of the cross. That's what I'm now convinced he, he feels and believes in his heart. At this level. Not up here. Down in here. then that means that the cross is saying, you're more than worth it. You're my delight. I am unwilling to be without you. You are my greatest treasure. I love you more than my life. And yet he's 100% aware of my sins. And, and not just my sins, my sinfulness. Y'all, we're full of snakes. We're capable of Nazi Germany. In our brain, we go, not us. We're good people. We would have never, we'd have lived back. How do you know? If you haven't reckoned with human evil, you haven't reckoned with you. And if you haven't reckoned with human evil, you're not ready for the tragedies life will bring you. And your basic assumptions about life, one day you will be liberated from them. And that will be a bad day. And then you'll have to go on a journey and reconstitute whether life's worth it or not. Because you knew it could happen because you saw the news. You just didn't think it would happen to you. Or you'll blow up your life so bad, and you knew it could happen to somebody, you just didn't know you were capable of blowing up your life. And then you got to figure out, do I have any worth? Do I have any Is life worth living? Where do we go from here? 
If Jesus took the cross for the joy set before him, then it means he loves me. But if he unwillingly takes the cross, listen to me, if Jesus unwillingly takes the cross, if he says, ah, I don't really want to do this, I hate this, and I'm kind of ticked that I have to do this, this had better work. You know how many of our strategies in life, that's what we say, this had better work. Why? Because we're trying to use any mechanism we can to make pain stop. Yeah. And as soon as it doesn't, then we go, oh, it's better. Yeah. I can't believe it. It's terrible. This didn't work either. All I'm trying to do is figure out the way forward. And we try faith as a way. We, let's get some oil poured on. Let's go to the. Let's go to church. Let's get baptized. Maybe that'll work. Faith is not a way to make things work. Faith is not a way to make the pain stop. That's not how. That's not even what faith is for. Oh, we, we're still in a triangle. We're still in a victim narrative. Now God's my protector, rescuer, and I'm still a powerless victim. And if He doesn't step in, now I have problems with God. The God who let Job suffer, the God who let go go through the whole Bible. The God who says, I'll be with you in suffering rather than I'll keep you from suffering. That's what he said. If we believe God, that Jesus endured the cross unwillingly, then we'll look at this like a lot of people I think do. And they'll look at the cross and annually when we when we recount Passion Week, that he died for us, when we recount the denials, when we recount all the seven stations of the cross, we'll look at that and we'll go, look how much I suck. Look what a burden I am to the Lord. Look how terrible I am. Look how sinful I am. Look how gross I am. I did that to him. How could I do that? And then we'll think of Jesus as saying, you owe me. You owe me. You owe me. You owe me. You, you, I grew up with that mindset. I owe him. And he died for me. I owe him everything. Holy smokes, you guys. It's a demonic gospel. It is not the cross. It is not the real meaning of the cross. You owe me. If you screw this up again, so help me. Look what you did to me. After all, I did to you. God, that's never in his mouth. It's never in his heart. It's in our mouth when we're wrong. That's in our heart when we're wrong. That's in our relationships when we're wrong. But it's not in his. Because we let sin against us create sin in us. Because we don't know who we are or whose we are or why we're here or where we stand. And pain is helping us get untethered from that cross. If we let it, and only if we let it. Most of us only figured out in the last half of life. In the first half of life, we're trying to do the, the triangle. We're trying to make life work, orderly, secure. I'll do this, God will bless, this will be awesome, I'll have an amazing life. Yeah. And the second half of life, that falls apart. Or doesn't satisfy. And, we're, and some people go through this journey younger. Praise God for that. But most of us don't go through the journey of deconstructing a stupid child faith, childish faith, not childlike faith, and having to reconstitute it around the suffering Jesus who's with us until we have to through pain. Listen, the most important sermon you're ever going to preach, do you know what it is? You're not going to preach, the most important sermon you're ever going to preach is not going to be preached with a microphone. You're not going to share it on Facebook or Instagram or Snapchat or whatever the heck. I don't even know what y'all use anymore. I don't even really know what the kids are doing these days. I watch Instagram reels for fun. I don't want to know what's going on in your lives. Uh, if I wanted to know what was going on in your lives, I wouldn't go to social media and I would talk to you. I go on Instagram to escape from my life. Thank you very much. So try to stay out of there with your actual stories. I'm not interested. I just want to laugh for, for, for a minute. You know, oh, and I learned a hack. I learned how to make a, a poached egg in the microwave. A little egg and a, egg and a I do this every morning now. Egg in a coffee cup, a little bit of water on top, 45 seconds, yolk is runny, whites are done. Boom. Brilliant. Your, your microwave may vary. Can I get back to the sermon? The most important sermon that you and I will ever preach will not be preached with a mic. <laughs> Start that over. The most important sermon you and I are ever going to preach will not be preached with a microphone. Do you know what it will be preached with? The most important sermon you and I will ever preach is how we respond when we are wrong. Amen. Amen. The 
most important sermon we ever have the opportunity to preach is preached with our attitudes, attitudes and actions when someone wrongs us. We're all gonna suffer in a broken world. We know it, we know it as little kids, but again, we know it theoretically. We don't think it's really gonna happen to us. Here's a sad truth. No matter how bad it is, somebody like you or me could always make it worse. By how we respond. If we respond like Jesus, we can keep tragedy at tragedy instead of making it a living hell. I mean, that's the reason that in Dante's Inferno, hell is an infinite bottom, because there's always some jacked up, selfish, well-meaning person with Bible verses who can make it worse. And Jesus, I've become convinced of this over the last decade, is the manliest man that has ever lived. He, when I answer the question, what is a real man? I, I always think Jesus is a real man. He, he took the manliest position towards life imaginable. How? How did he do it? How did he do it? I choose this. We're thrown into life with no choice. But guess what? Whether, we're, whether we choose our life, whether we embrace our life with a full heart and, and take responsibility for who we become and how we respond, most of us go, well, I was thrown here and I wasn't prepared and this is wrong. Hell and pain avoidance is on the throne of our heart and we never, throw, we never with a full heart, <coughs> choose this. And Jesus says, I chose this. No one takes my life from me. That is the manliest man I've ever met. But it doesn't look like it to the world, does it? They go, ah, oh, he's weak, ah, oh, he's fa he failed, ah, oh, he doesn't have any authority. Oh, the pilot says, I have authority over, aren't you scared? And he goes, you have no authority, it wasn't given to you. I could call a thousand, come on. You don't even know who you are, who is you are. You think you have power over me, you have no power over me. You are unable to make me happy. What? Jesus is the manliest man that I've ever known. And anyone who doesn't understand the meaning of the Bible as a giant love story, because most of us think the Bible is like a how-to guide. If you'll do this, God will do this, and then you'll be blessed. Grow up. That is a baby version of the Bible. The Bible is a love story, and we're not the hero. Jesus is the hero, and we are the target of his love. It's a love story. Your life is meant to be a love story. Just nobody told us that at the beginning. Well, the gospel's telling us now. And when Jesus says to you and me, when he says, take up your cross, deny yourself, and follow me, do you know what he's saying? He's saying, could you please get as free as I can? Could you please escape the victim triangle that you've been living in? Could you please walk in the authority to lay your life down and take your life up so that you know no one takes my life from me? I lay it down of my own accord. So that in the midst of any suffering, any wrong, any tragedy, cancer, heart attack, betrayals of friends, financial ruin, I don't know what it is, loss of a child even, we with a full heart say, I belong to God. I embrace the essential goodness of life in a broken world. I embrace the mystery and I say, I'm laying my life down and I exist to not turn this tragedy into a living hell, but to be able to care for the ones who come from the inside. So that I can help plan dad's funeral instead of be out drunk. Is that practical enough? <laughs> Take up your cross and follow me is Jesus inviting us to get radically free the way he's free. And we've always thought, oh, take up your cross and follow me means we're gonna grow, we're gonna really, you know, here we go, we're gonna really ratchet up our spirituality now. No, it's not a ratcheting up, it's like a letting go. It's like a letting go. Many of us, maybe most of us, we live with this sort of unexamined false assumption that if we generally do the right thing, then God will protect and bless us. And we don't say it out loud. We don't say it out loud. You know when we say it? 
We say it with our reactions and our pain. Because that system doesn't work eventually. For some people, it seems to work. Maybe because their, their dad was amazing as the protector, their father, their God figure, the triangle, or their church, or their community was so protected from great tragedy, or they just got lucky. Everything's just working for them. But for most of us, that doesn't work very long. And then what are we going to do? When our basic faith assumptions about the world that we're building all of our other beliefs on, when that is shattered, then what? Well, then, it usually feels like we've lost our faith, or maybe that we're bitter against God, or maybe if we try to maintain it, that I must have failed God, so this is just proof that I'm very sinful and deserve this. You been to any of those places lately? God wasn't faithful to me, or I must just be exceptionally stupid and sinful, or maybe there is no God. The triangle will do that to you. And what we previously then, what we called faith, which wasn't faith at all, it was like a system that just made us feel safe, no longer works to make sense of reality. And, and some of us, when I, when I say the word faith, you think belief in unprovable and strange things like Jesus is going to come back on a horse one day, or that the sun stood still during Joshua's uh, siege of Jericho. That's not faith, guys. Those are just beliefs. That's not faith. You know what faith is? It's more like a kind of courage in the face of the absolute tragedy of life. Faith is more like courage in the face of the absolute tragedy of life than it is in belief in unprovable irrational things. No, faith has everything to do with successfully navigating reality. Are you with me? So, the following statements are faith statements. How about this one? Life is good and worth living in spite of tragedy and ultimately death. That's a faith conviction. Life is good and worth living in spite of tragedy and ultimately in spite of death. Dude, that's faith. That takes faith. But that's not a naive faith, is it? Because it doesn't say, life is good and it will go great. Just please the Lord. No, no, no. Life is good and worth living. Worth living. Man, I remember the day that I realized that worship is the opposite of a spirit of suicide. It was like a big moment for me. Because whatever else worship says, it says, it is good that I exist. It has to. How would I be like, yeah, if it is bad that I exist? Here's another one. God is trustworthy and good despite allowing me to experience great suffering. That's a faith conviction. God is trustworthy and good despite allowing me to experience great suffering. That's faith. Or how about this one? Take it in, friends. I have value and I'm worth loving in spite of all my flaws. Look, if you committed murder, you are still worth loving. If the gospel's true. Now, if the gospel, if you don't believe that, if you're like, now those people are just worthless now and we should just kill them, then you, then you haven't, first of all, you haven't owned that you are a murderer. You, you haven't owned that you're capable of that kind of evil yet. And that means you're very naive about yourself. Well, Simon and Mary thing that we talked about in the singing time. I have value, and I'm worth loving in spite of all my flaws. That's a faith conviction. And then maybe you can even begin to start working on agreeing with God's love for you and taking better care of yourself. Instead of treating yourself like trash and believing the devil and talking like the devil about yourself. Faith. How about this one? Other people, other people, are immensely valuable. Immensely valuable. In fact, they're worth me shedding my blood for. Other people are immensely valuable in spite of also being capable of immense evil. That's a faith conviction. But, but notice how these, these faith convictions have sort of gone through the fire. They're not just like, people are awesome and they're made in God's image. They're so cool, except for those people. Draw boundaries. 
Throw those people away because they're stupid narcissists. <laughs> and we've become so victimized in our culture that we're actually championing a victim narrative and a victim's pop psychology, which means we must imagine we're not selfish and we're not betrayers and we're not murderers and we're not full cry and we're not. I'm not saying don't draw healthy boundaries. I'm saying the worst sinner in your mind should be you because you're the only one that you have inside knowledge of all your sins. You only know pieces and bits of other people's sins, but if you'll just lay awake at night and ask the Lord, is there anything I'm doing right now that's actually wrong and destructive? You'll find 10 things quick if you're honest. If you, and yet, despite all your flaws, he says, I'd rather die than be without you. He's not in a, his love for me is not based on him having illusions about me. When you go into a marriage, most of your love toward each other is based on the illusion. My dad at my wedding, this is what he said. He said, when I was getting married, all, I didn't think I was going to have to die for Carol. All I was thinking was all that she was bringing to my life. Oh, she was attractive. She was wonderful. We're going to have such a great time together. I wasn't, he's like, I wasn't thinking about the character of Christ being formed into me, suffering and laying my life down for her sake in spite of her various sins. Are you nuts? I was like, she looked good. <laughs> and see, this is why marriage needs something like a bedrock commitment that no matter what, I'm never leaving. Because we're actually that broken and sinful that to do the work required to love another sinner at that level for that long requires that kind of commitment where we actually have people stand around us and bear witness in, in front of a holy God that this crap's going to be real. But why? 50% of marriages end in divorce? Because we don't know, we don't understand Jesus is why. Now it takes two to tango, so some people have to divorce way against their will, who would have been willing to suffer and die on many crosses, but the other person will jettison. And then there are some things where even Jesus himself says, it's too much, it's okay. In the case of infidelity, he says that. But that doesn't mean you have to. We can do what he did. In the case of our infidelity, come on, guys. You've cheated on the Lord repeatedly. I don't know how I got on marriage. The undoing of our naive map of the world allows us, usually through crisis and loss, to find a faith that actually gets us somewhere. Pain it invites us into a great unlearning where we can abandon a belief in Jesus who suffers so we don't have to. Are you with me or the illusion? The child version of the faith says, Jesus suffered so we don't have to. That's a childish faith. And pain it allows us to abandon a faith that's not even an accurate map of the world and abandon this belief in Jesus who suffers so we don't have to, so we can embrace a real faith in Jesus who teaches us how to suffer, live, and love well. Without ever letting sin against me create sin in me without anything having the right to name me but the Father, where love is the motive and the shape of my life. That's real faith. That's the message of the gospel. And that's going to get us somewhere. See, listen, in the fall, the character of the devil was actually reproduced in us. The, the actual character of the devil was reproduced in us. And God's great goal is for the character of Jesus to be reproduced in us. And, and, and the things the enemy throws at you intending to crush you, the Father allows with the intention of having those very things heal you of the demonic bent of my heart, your heart, our hearts. It sure doesn't feel good at the time, does it? You ask Jesus, hey, does it feel good up there on the cross? Well, stupid question. But it's worth it. So listen, for those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. Does that sound like he suffered instead of you? Or does that sound like he suffered for and as you to invite you into the liberty of the cross? The, the freedom, the power, the authority of suffering well with the right heart orientation. When we said our big yes to Jesus, we signed on for this, we just didn't know it. 
we thought we came from forgiveness of sins, some healed sicknesses. Oh, help me stop doing that thing that makes me feel bad when I get up. That's kind of what we did. We didn't realize that it was like he was going to keep pulling and pulling and pulling and say, you know what? I want you all the way free. I want you all the way free. I want you all the way free. Oh, no, this is far enough. Thank you. This is my, okay, this is my, uh, ding, 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 ding. This is my stop. Stop the bus. Stop the bus. But so we said our yes to Jesus. We didn't know it, but we signed off for this. We signed on to learn how to walk in the authority and lay our lives down and take them back up. We signed on to be conformed to the image of the Son. We signed on to be sons and daughters of the living God. Right? To walk as Jesus in Matthew 5 says, if you love those who love you, how is that any different than, than unsaved pagans who don't even know God? They all love people who love them. But you want to show me somebody who's a son and daughter of God? They love genuinely from the heart. Genuinely from the heart without resentment, those who hate them and mistreat them. What? How? Well, um, you got some time, and also, are you willing to take up this cross and follow me? Let's talk. I'm done. That's the whole sermon. Prayer team can come on. I mean, I'm going to pray a prayer at the end, but. You doing okay? Was that nice and light and fluffy? Hey, welcome to church. We're inviting you to die. Uh, how, how, how are you doing today? Stand together. Um, yeah. If, if you've been in a war this week and uh, yeah. and you need a touch from the Lord, um, I want to pray for you. Because that's what I got. And if, does anybody got anything going on with their uh, left uh, calf? So, got that. So, trying to figure out how to like, pull this in. I think sometimes um, we're not aware of the attacks that are on us, or on our marriage, on our family, finances, health, whatever it is. And we kind of got this vision during worship of just all these, and it's crazy, I hate snakes. Little small black slithers, like really tiny, like babies, just slithering around. And I thought, hmm, <coughs> if it was a boa constrictor or a python, we would freak out, right? We would be very aware of that, <laughs> that presence. But sometimes it's the little things, it's the little demonic activity that, that can trip us up. And you know, I was on the phone with Stan the other night because Rusty and I, our family has just had a lot of stuff going on that hasn't been good. And I told him, I'm like, you know, I just had reached a, a point of frustration. I'm like, what the heck? You know, we've talked to other people, and not, and it's not that it hasn't been good counsel. It's just, you know, you haven't gotten a breakthrough that you didn't even know you really needed. And so I was on the phone with Stan, and we're at the campground, and I'm just pacing back and forth. I don't know who could hear me, and I didn't really care. Um, and he just started, we just started talking, and he started out like the anointing I could tell started falling on Stan because his voice shifted, and he started asking different questions. And we got to the root of it, and there was just you don't always know the burdens that you're carrying or how weighed down you've become until they're lifted. And I think there's a lot of us in here, I'm just guessing, that have been walking around oppressed, weighed down with some kind of burden or strife or struggle, health issue, whatever it may be. It can manifest in so many different ways, and we've tolerated it. Well, I can tell you right now, if you're a follower of Jesus, you should not be tolerating. I should not have been tolerating. Rusty and I shouldn't have been tolerating. That's why we need the body of Christ. We need those people that we can go to to help us. Because I was telling you, I'm like, dude, I am praying. I'm asking God for revelation, and I'm getting nothing. So then I start, then I started talking to Stan. And the revelation started coming, and we got to the root of it, and it got broken off. So if you need that today, or you even think you might need it, 
here today, you should be up here. Don't, don't leave and let the enemy torture you any further. Because it's only going to get worse. And that's what we've gone through for the last few months. It just kept getting worse. I'm like, we're reading the word, we're praying. But a door was open. Sometimes you don't know. So don't leave here. If you've been going through that, do not walk back out that door carrying that crap. Okay? Come up and get prayer. Thanks. I got a spiritual code now. <laughs> Does anybody, if you're having pain in the neck, please come up and get prayer. What if, if you are in pain? That's correct. That's correct. You can just listen to this, but try to try to get your heart into this place. I am no victim. I'm God's kid. And I'm not going to be ruled by weakness and resentment and cowardice. And others might mistake my stance as weakness and foolishness, but my willingness to forgive, my willingness to have mercy, my willingness to be kind is in fact great courage. It is great strength. It's the very authority of the Father to lay down my life and take my life back up. I refuse to become a monster to defeat a monster. I will overcome evil with good. I will trust the justice and goodness of the Father and not my own wisdom. And it's like if you can maybe back, imagine hearing the voice of Jesus as he currently is, right? He's the risen lamb, not just the slain lamb. And hear him saying, follow me, follow me. Follow me. And this is what I wrote. You're going to say, well, that's really kind of intense. But as I enter the battle, you will see the glint of joy in my eye. For I will show that characteristic that every true soldier and every true saint exhibits. Contempt for death. Father, I trust my life in your hands. Amen.